that, I'll get started. Jen, July 15th, 2021. I'm alone in the company warehouse. Three stories above at the top of the grocery pool, a few scattered bay lights cast dark blue shadows between heavy and nebulous objects. It looks like the beginning of a star system. As I walk in search for my shift station, I hear the sound of a solitary grocery sorter. Hello? No one answers. The entire building is deserted. I came back to fetch my jacket, but there's no one around. Unused heavy lifting exoskeletons are strung up like carcasses. Rows and rows of anonymous orders wait in silence to be sorted. I walk into a clearing. I see the double jointed shadow. I see the, sh I see the sorter. It moves its mechanized arm in a stilted, uneasy pattern. When I approach, the arm stops in midair. It's holding something in its finger, in its fingers. It's holding my jacket. I walk up slowly. I make eye contact with its scanner. I grab the jacket, but it doesn't let go. Another arm swings around from behind its broad base and grabs my wrist. I tense up and nearly pull away, but the grip's not firm or menacing. We stand this way for a while, scanning each other, collecting data. It lets go of the jacket. It places its suction cup fingers onto my chest between my breasts and applies pressure. I find myself slowly sinking to the floor, letting its fingers guide me down. I relinquish control to the robot. When my body is fully prostrate on the ground, its silicone cups glide down my abdomen and circle my navel. The other arm scans a, sc a scar on my forehead, scans a freckle, continues to move down and scan all of my most intimate marks. It reads me front to back. I'm so red, I'm dog-eared. I look around, but there's still no sign of life. I can't explain it, but I'm so turned on. I unbutton my pants and flay the waistband open wide. Synthetic fingers circle the curls in my pubic hair. The sensation is alien and thrilling. My breath is heavy and uneven as it tugs at my briefs. I grip its hand before it enters me and I look up. There's an opening, a rubbery orifice just below its machinic midriff. I reach for the hole, but it pulls its arm back to cover it. I try to pin it down, but my sweat makes for a slippery tussle. I stand up, grab one of its wrists, and place it under the weight of my foot. I grab its other arm with one hand and leer at its scanner. I goad. You like that, don't you? I look for a nipple or a knob or a switch to tweak with my fingertips, but its sleek surfaces offer up no other erogenous zones. I reach for the hole again and its arms squirm. I place my mouth against the hole and lick. The edges of the orifice curl as I wet them with my saliva. The taste is salty from residual grease. I dip two fingers inside and the whole machine shakes. It tries to push me away, but somehow I overpower it. I dip three fingers, then four, past the knuckles, past the wrist. I thrust in and out and in and out and in. The sorter makes no sound, has no mouth to speak, but its scanning eye darts back and forth in frantic motion. It's titillated or terrified, I'm not sure which. I press hard into the hole. I'm looking for the button that will make it come. A far off voice echoes through the warehouse, one muffled monosyllabic with a question mark on the end. I quickly pull out my arm to find my fist covered in fluid. The voice calls out again, much closer this time, and I realize it's calling my name. I wipe my wet fist against the insides of my thighs and gaze up. 
a hand, a human hand, shakes my shoulder. I turn my head and it's trouble and we're not at the warehouse, we're in her bed. She's still shaking my shoulder. Jen, Jen, wake up, you're moaning like crazy. What, I ask, suddenly awake and red hot. I mean, it's cool, she caresses my arm. It was actually kind of sexy. Oh. I roll over and press my face into the wall. I play dead. Trouble is silent and I hope she's moved on. So, you gonna tell me what you dreamed about? She asks. I fake snore and she pinches, she pinches my shoulder. Ow! I rub the tender skin and turn to face her. It was nothing, it was just a dumb dream. She sighs and lays down next to me with her head on her hand like she's got all the time in the world. Okay, fine, I relent. I dreamed, I dreamed I fucked a robot. She lets out one loud staccato laugh, ha! And turns to grab a bowl of cherry tomatoes on the desk behind her. She's popping them like popcorn. Go on. You know the grocery sorters, the ones I work with at the warehouse? She sits up and a tomato falls from the bowl onto the bed. Wait a second. You dreamed you fucked a grocery sorter? Oh, this is good shit, Jen. I squirm and furrow my brow. And I liked it a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was nothing like when I'm with you. She rolls her eyes as she scoops up the fallen tomato. Yeah, yeah, noted. Did the robot like it? Oh, I don't know, it couldn't speak. I don't actually know if it understood pleasure or if it was just going through automated motions. At some point I penetrated it. Oh, there's a, sorry, I'm just pausing for a second. Can you still see the image? Okay. At some point, I penetrated it. OMG, was it in robot ecstasy? Like I said, it couldn't speak. In the heat of the moment, I couldn't tell, but now I'm second guessing if it even wanted me inside of it. She stops chewing. You raped a robot? My cheeks emit solar flares. What? No, I don't think so. It all happened so fast. I mean, it came on to me first. Can robots even give consent? Her jaw drops. That's fucked up, yo. I groan in humiliation and turn to face the wall again. She spoons me and tries to feed me a tomato, but I purse my lips. Jen, baby, I'm just fooling with you, she says. It's totally normal to indulge in a little work revenge fantasy. You're just, uh, a little hornier than the rest of us. Oh, shut up. I swat her hand as she tries to wrap it around my waist. Want to hear something more fucked up? She asks. She's offering me an out. I take it. Okay. I just took on a super shady UX gig. What is it this time? She sits up. It's a service that sucks data sweat from unsuspecting chums while they're browsing the web. I sit up too. What's data sweat? It's like the surplus of surplus value. I blink back, oblivious. Okay, so imagine you're at work stocking shelves at the grocery pool, right? She explains. The pool is extracting value from your labor by selling the products of your labor at a higher cost than what they're paying you. Let's say the pool makes $100 for every $15 worth of labor you give them. So their profit is the surplus value that they extract from your wages after overhead. I fish out the last tomato from the bowl and deadpan. You know I flunked econ. She continues. Now get this. Imagine you're sweating all day. They haven't fixed the air conditioners. Your clothes are soaked through and below your feet there's a little drain. That drain is collecting all of your sweat and the pool is bottling it and selling it as a promotional energy drink back to its workers or whatever. Gross. I scrunch my nose and bring the tomato to my lips. 
Trouble snatches it before I can put it in my mouth and holds it between your thumb and forefinger. This tomato is all the value you produce. I'm your employer and you're you. She eats the tomato. What the hell, I whine. She chews and swallows. That's basically what data sweat it is. It's all the extra value that gets extracted above and beyond your labor. Except with data sweat, you wouldn't know I stole the tomato in the first place because you wouldn't even know you're producing it. And technically, data sweat is extracted from consumers, not workers, but all consumers are unwitting laborers anyways, so the analogy still works. She tilts her head as if to reconsider and then nods in agreement with herself. My stomach growls. So what exactly is the gig? Companies pay in to generate false behaviors and oblivious consumers, mostly bottom feeder, feeder businesses. I'm building the back end to make it happen. You mean like targeted ads? It's more insidious than that. She goes on to describe a complicated series of exploitations that require the consumer to unknowingly fork over their own personal data in order to buy it back as a beautiful, expensive product in the end. She says it's akin to reverse shoplifting. I think it sounds more like subliminal extortion. Damn, trouble, that sounds kind of evil. I don't conceal my disappointment. Don't get all high and mighty, my dear robot fucker. She shifts her weight away from me. I do what it takes to take care of my own. I pay the rent so that the other sisters in the house don't have to worry about notifications from a friggin' landlord app reminding them they're five days past due. The garden out back? I made that happen so that we can provide for ourselves and don't have to rely on a grocery pool for food. And when it comes to work, I don't feel bad for people who are too naive or proud to believe that they're being manipulated. I know she doesn't believe that. She's staking out to prove a point. But there's got to be other jobs you can take trouble. Why this one? She sighs. Look, do I wish we lived in a world where everyone owned their own data and were properly compensated for its use? Shit, yeah, but we don't. And it's a two for one. I get paid and I learn the tactics of the enemy. I'm well prepared for the future. Are you? I can feel the wall going up between us like hot radiation. I'm aching for elsewhere. My vision shifts to the bold purple text on the poster hanging on the wall behind her. All identity is labor. So where's my paycheck? I say, fuck that. If I'm not getting paid, I refuse to produce it. It's just not something I would do if I was in your position, I say, losing interest as the tension mounts. See, that's your problem, Jen. She throws her hands up in, in resignation. You would never be in my position because you're totally incapable of taking a position at all. I know how you view yourself. You think you're so enigmatic and ill-defined, but you're actually really simple, Jen. You're scared, simple as that. Now, hold on, I interject. I don't think, trouble continues. Scared to pick a side or make a choice? You think setting up camp in the middle absolves you of, of making actual de decisions in your life. It's why you still live in your grandma's attic. It's why every time I even talk about taking a trip out of town, you flinch. You don't use social media out of some misguided revolt against surveillance capitalism, but you work at a fucking grocery fulfillment center owned by the wealthiest man on the planet who, by the way, is a surveillance capitalist. She's edging towards supernova. I'm a blue dwarf in dimming. And she's wrong. I'm not scared of taking a position, I think. She leans against the wall with her arms in a knot. Hell, I don't even know if we're a couple at this point. I slide my ass towards the edge of the bed and get up. Yeah, maybe not. I tear out towards the chip sky, alopecia blue and pink. My eyes catch the day dying daylight like dust and I squint. I'm attended by the squeak of a rusty chain. An intersection halfway home triggers some inward change that I can't quite name. I can feel the magnetic force of that crossroads tugging at my neck, even as I put two blocks distance between me and there. 
I turn around, bike back. The intersection is quiet. On one corner, there's a glossy bus shelter with a bevy of benches where a bevy of benches used to be, framed by the gas station behind it. It's the kind of place that doesn't need a sign that says, gentrification was here because you know, you always know. I swing into the lot and dismount, balancing my weight against the bike frame. When grandpa left for the cosmos, grandma stuck her face in the earth. She was too deep in her own grief to notice or care when I'd leave the house for the better part of each day. I would walk to the same intersection in the morning and mingle with the men waiting for work. They gathered in front of this gas station where white faces and pickup trucks would pull in to collect day workers. The ones who didn't ride off would linger at the rusted benches, waiting for work that would never come. I would stand there all day with them, silent and soaking it in. The only sound I'd make was to laugh at their crude jokes. I listened intently to their twice repeated stories and pretended to understand when they switched to Spanish. I picked up their coarse mannerisms in order to fold them in into my own. I was in a brown study. I did this every day for weeks. My hair was short and my chest was flat. They called me muchacho and patted my shoulder like I was one of the boys. They never questioned my presence. Even when I lingered until the last of them would leave, the sky striated with dark, dark stretch marks. After days so full, they surpassed their own limits and had the scars to prove it. The irony of hanging out with these older men after my grandpa died was not lost on me, even as an 11 year old, but it worked. I didn't have to grieve. I didn't have to be a girl. I didn't have to do anything but exist. I didn't tell trouble everything. I didn't tell her what I saw, moments before waking above the sorter's scanning eye, a model name too clear to be mistaken, Genesis, same as mine. It's too stupid not to laugh. Under the weight of my own gravity, I collapse into myself. Thank you.